Tera tātou kato e hui hui mai nei i tēnei ahi ahi, nau mai, whakatau mai ki te puno Waikato. Kia ora everyone, welcome um, to um, Trust Waikato and welcome to our first session um, aptly named Puna Kōrero. Before we start, I'm going to open up our session with a karakia and then I'll hand it over to Trust Waikato's Chief Executive, Dennis Tewton. Nō reira mi noi tātou. Ke honore he kororea ki tātua he mau ngā rongo kirimi te whenua i whakaaro pai ki ngā tangata katō. Nō reira he tātua whakakata mai ki a mātou e tēnei wā, ara hia iwa mātou mahi, kia mārama, kia tika mō, nā tangata katoa rire rire hau pai mārere. Kei a koe, Dennis. Thank you, Rongo, and um, thank you for the um, um, lovely welcome there, um, Dr. Rawiri. Um, thank you, mate, for making time for coming in today. And we're just waiting for Jade as well, so um, Jade will pop up as she comes into the into the hui. Um, before I pass over to you, uh, Rauri, I, I would like to. Um, uh, someone saying that they, I, I can't hear you. Anyway, we'll carry on. Oh, kia ora, Jade. How are you? Good, thank you. I don't have mine. Cool, we're just starting off and I just uh, want to take a moment to acknowledge the community sector and the four purpose organisations that are joining us today. Um, for those at the front line working on um, vaccinations and testings, all those you know supporting our community uh, through food provision and other, other sorts of provisions, for those that uh, offer those wraparound services to our vulnerable communities, and for those that are working in the mental health and the um, counselling uh, services where they're so much needed and those that are supporting those families that are facing um, an increased family violence. You know, we are in inspired and in awe of all the work that you do. Um, we at Trust Waikato understand um, how much uh, that you contribute and how much you have contributed to the response, especially around COVID. And I firmly believe that lives have been saved by the work of the for purpose and the community sector. Uh, just touching base on Puna Kōrero and Trusted Voices today is this is the first one where we've had in this series and we're looking for this as to be a platform to bring trusted people in uh, so we can hear from those that are experts in their fields or have a view around how we can improve equity or how we can improve community outcomes and really privileged today to have Rāwari and Jade come through and we really do appreciate that um, as well. Look, if any of you have any questions, please use the Q&A function. Uh, we will moderate that. We just we want this to be a place of uh, 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 a, a nice place for people to come in and a safe place for people to come in and ask those questions as well. Um, so, look, uh, that's enough from me because I do tend to talk too much. I'd like to pass over to you, Jade, and um, first off, if we can hear from you in terms of what your, your thoughts are around the COVID response. But before I do that, I do want to acknowledge the work that you do as an endocrinologist. I know the work that you do with the young kids that have gone through a cancer journey and, and what you do for them as they go through that. And that is awe inspiring in itself. Uh, and you know um, the, the complexities that you must deal with every day is interesting. So Jade, handing over to you and, and, and just a, an overview of your response around COVID and what your thoughts are. On nei ranga mihi ki a koutou, um, ko Jay Tamate tōku ingoa, he uri ahau no Ngāti Manupoto, no Ngāti Kahanunu Hoki. Um, so my name is Jay Tamate and thank you for the introduction, Dennis. Um, so yeah, I um, have just as a little bit of introduction of myself and um, what I bring here, um, I do wear lots of different potai. Um, so locally here in Waikato, um, I work as a clinician um, at the Hohipera uh, for about half of the week and then as an academic for the University of Auckland um, with a particular interest in Māori health and the way in which we design healthcare systems um, to dr potentially drive or mitigate inequity. Um, and in the last, since the very beginning of the COVID outbreak have um, stepped up into a clinical leadership role here in the Waikato DHB um, as one of our clinical equity leads. Um, so yes, yeah, so considering the way in which we deliver healthcare locally to be sure that we're focusing on Māori. Uh, in the last month, that's also meant being drawn here into our COVID response here at the DHB, supporting um, the mahi that's being done to support Fano, uh, who are being impacted by COVID in the Waikato Rohe currently. Um, alongside Rawiri, uh, I'm a member of the Ropu Whakakaupapa Uruta uh, and co-chair our um, hospital uh, leads um, 
in that ropu, so different clinicians working in hohepera. Um, so I guess to answer your first question, uh, Dennis, about the COVID response, um, I think that uh, like, like all things in healthcare, um, COVID has really just uh, applied a little bit of pressure, or a lot of bit of pressure to the system uh, that has meant that the inequities that we're in healthcare access, um, care and outcome that we've been um, seeing for generations have been really ramped up and amplified by that pressure uh, that's been applied by COVID. And that's in all aspects um, of health and social care uh, in this, um, and I guess, to lean, lean on that or build on from that as we go into this next phase, uh, the way we get through that will be by doing two things, ensuring that we focus that our, our response is appropriate for Māori and our Pacific whanaunga, because if we do that right, then we'll do it right for everyone. Um, and ensuring that we do that together as a team, um, using all our different shared expertise um, and the, the stronger our communities are, the stronger we will get, the better we'll get through that. So those are my overarching whakaaro. Um, yeah, kia ora. Thank you, and uh, Rāwari, we're pleased to hear from you. Um, kia ora tātou. Uh, ko taku mihi anō ki a tātou e tāunau, e whakawhaiti nei mo tēne kaupapa. Ko ia tērā te, te hauora ngai tātou. Um, tēnei au he huru, te he huri a hau no Ngāti Henerangi no Ngāti Raukawa. Um, yeah, so Albert McCree Jensen, I'm a GP and I'm a clinical director for a primary healthcare organisation. We look after 55 clinics across five DHB areas, 235,000 patients, and um, been drawn into a lot of this work through COVID um, since the outbreak, and really interested now in, in how we get through what is the most significant phase of. Um, COVID for us as a nation. We're in an interesting place. We've got um, a vaccination program, which is, um, you know, reaching um, in the high 80s and 90% of community and some parts of our community, like here in Auckland, 92% uh, of Māori over the age of 65 are vaccinated. Um, and then other parts of our community where we, we haven't got the vaccination program reaching anywhere near enough to, to be protected. And COVID's travelling. COVID's travelling in Auckland, it's travelling in Northland, it's travelling in Waikato. Um, so it's a moment where in the health system we're doing an incredible amount of work trying to do testing and do vaccinations and now manage increasing numbers of whānau with COVID. And then just for a moment, thinking about the whānau who've got COVID, it's predictable that it's really reached into um, communities that have been underserved for a long time. Uh, they are more likely to be overcrowded. They're more likely to be living in housing conditions which are pretty unsuitable. They're more likely to be um, in the cash economy rather than the economy where you get a, um, a COVID um, uh, you know, relief package from your employer. Um, they're more likely to be um, in complex social situations in terms of mental health or um, drug and alcohol addictions. Um, so in general, this is a, um, a cohort, a part of our community that really needs a comprehensive um, solution right now. And uh, so all of that really makes for, I think, some uh, very real complexities right now. But I'm um, just really wrapped to be here with you and there's 50 or 60 people um, online, and so I'm going to ignore the chat and just wait until Dennis asks me a question. Kia ora. Yeah, I'm going to come through with a question right now, and the narrative um, that is in the mainstream media at the moment appears to be, or well, doesn't appear to be, I think it is that um, Māori are playing catch-up and uh, in a way have um, not taken up the opportunity to get vaccinated when we know that actually that's not the way it was. It was designed uh, for that to occur with when we're going through the age groups and unfortunately with a you know, younger demographic Māori and Pacifica and probably I, I would like to now think about um, our ethnic communities coming into this play as well have been disadvantaged I think because of the way that this was designed and no thought that was had given to how it could be shaped to answer um, uh, a, a response for Māori and Pacifica and the like. What are your thoughts on that and how do we make sure that we can improve 
uh, response going forward when we face these crises. Shall we go to Jade first? Yeah. All right then. Um, so first, just to agree uh, with your represent or representation of the misrepresentation in media, uh, we're not playing catch up. We've got left behind. Um, and that's, uh, we need to be really explicit about that. Um, and Rawari and I at, in Te Rope Whakaupapa Urata, amongst many other groups, um, advised that that was going to be the issue. Um, you know, we would, it would be a different situation now if this had not been predictable, but it was utterly predictable uh, and it was outlined as what would happen um, if things weren't done differently. Um, however, it is where we are now uh, and we need to go forward. And what concerns me more around that narrative in the media now is it's almost an idea, this facade or that Māori are the ones holding the system back or the movement forward back. And actually, again, we were left behind um, and the, that needs to be acknowledged as we make decisions going forward about changes in levels or changes in approach. Um, in saying all that, I want to acknowledge the amazing amount of work our providers, our communities, our iwi have done um, right from the start and give, taken every opportunity that it's, that's been given to them to ensure that our whānau have been vaccinated, to ensure that our whānau feel safe in the system and feel safe and have people they can trust to talk to them about um, making this important decision um, and that mahi must continue um, so as we start to see cases around that doesn't change anything we still need to be focused on vaccinating our whanau making sure that every person who is eligible who wants a vaccine who can have a vaccine and gets their vaccine in a way that's safe and appropriate for them. Um, and so I, I guess I'm just, I, I think it's really important that as we get more used to having cases around that she can't change, or even if we get to this magical 90, that can't change the fact that our focus still has to be on vaccinating every whānau member who wants and can have it. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with you, Jade. I think the, um, the narrative that we're kind of contesting is regrettable. Um, in actual fact, if you look at the, the Māori population, as you said, Dennis, it's, it's younger. And so we've come to the vaccination um, framework, the sequencing framework, we've come to it later. You know, I think it was something like September the 9th when Group 4, and that's a huge part of the Māori population's in Group 4. And so our trajectory, our, the velocity of our vaccination campaign actually is better than mainstream has been since March the 9th. So um, I think we're doing a really great job. Um, I think it's regrettable that we weren't included earlier in the framework. That is what it is. Um, we've got this really fabulous, um, complete commitment from Māori providers up and down the country to do the very best job. And, and I'm confident that we're going to get to the sort of 95% vaccination um, rate, and that will be really, really um, protective for Māori communities, and actually, it'll be really protective for our whole health system. Yeah, so I think we're going to get there, um, but it's a bumpy road. And is that bumpy road, has that been uh, uh, made more bumpy by the fact that data's not been shared with um, uh, final order providers, especially where they don't know where to go. I think John Tamahiri has um, said that it's a fishing expedition when they're knocking on doors. Um, uh, and again, is that what we're seeing inequity of, of um, data, of uh, all tools that are available, hampering vaccination rates for Māori Pacifica and other communities? Yeah, data's been an issue for a long time. And, um, you know, Te Rōpi Kaupapa Urita has been pretty loud about concerns about the quality of ethnicity data and, um, you know, that goes back for more than 12 months. Um, look, sharing health information is a, it's a complex calculation. I've got to be straight up. I think in general, the idea that you share somebody's health information in New Zealand is really, really tightly controlled, the Health Information Privacy Act. And, and I think that's a really good framework for it. Um, having said that, I've been public in saying that I think the, High Court case, the, the judge was right in saying it's a break glass moment. And the features for breaking the glass are that it's a health emergency, 
that it's a very limited data set that would be shared, that it would be shared with an organization that has worked in the health sector, and um, it would be shared for a specific purpose to offer a health service. And, and so all of those things together, I'm in favor of breaking the glass and doing the right thing. But having said that, I know that that data has been shared already with multiple other organizations. And so in fact, we've got um, Māori who have been rung up multiple times by organizations which are not culturally concordant. And some of them are using, you know, very frank vernacular to tell um, the call center people to go away and leave them alone. So even if that data was shared today, I think it, it's been, um, it's, it's too late and now it's been muddied by other providers. So it's probably not as helpful as it should have been and it should have been done already, but you know, complex area. Yeah, thank you, Jade. Um, uh, any yeah, I agree with everything that Awadi has said, although I would make the point that that's the national response. That's what, you know, that, that's a conversation between the ministry uh, and the Fun Order Commissioning Agency, um, but that, you know, locally, uh, we've worked really hard to partner with our providers in the community, um, with our partners throughout who have been leading the vaccination um, approach. Uh, and we've worked, you know, shared uh, what we can, how we can to ensure that actually we're doing this right for our community within Waikato. Um, so while I acknowledge the issue and I agree that it's uh, applied, you know, it's caused a lot of interest uh, with the court case. Um, I think it's um, not necessarily representative of what's been going on here. Oh, that's, that's, that's good to hear. <laughs> um, we have a couple of questions in the chat around access to information, um, access to information of what happens uh, when um, family or whanau get COVID where to, and have to self-isolate what happens when, unfortunately, you know, some die from COVID? What are the what are the where to find the information, and where can all that uh, uh, be found? And so, community and, and families can work through that. Um, what is a way that we can get better information out than going to a Ministry of Health website, which I find really confusing myself, trying to navigate all that, so that we can understand as a community what the, what is available? How do we do that effectively? Uh, and so that we can get trusted sources as well. Silence. Um, the, the, look, the pause is totally, I totally get that question. Um, I still go to the website that the government has to check when somebody says that, you know, somebody, a patient will ask me, how do I get across the border to go, my, my auntie's dying. And so I have to go to the, the the, um, government website to try and navigate what is the latest set of instructions and the latest set of arrangements. Um, so there's no easy way around that. Te Rōpi Whakakaupapa Uruta, our website, uruta.māori.nz, is somewhat helpful, um, but every time we change settings or alert levels or traffic lights and, you know, all of those things change. And so we're not fully up to date. We're working on it. We want to give some good information for whānau about tangihanga. Um, that's clearly going to be an issue for us going forward. And you know, I'm sorry to tell you people, but tangihanga are gonna be a feature of the next um, six to eight weeks in, in the outbreak. And um, unfortunately, we've seen the guidance and the rules change in ways that have been unhelpful. I'm not that confident that we're gonna get into the right place quickly, but Uruta is working on uh, having whānau facing information that supports them through some of those complexities and we're trying to advocate for the right set of arrangements and the right policies and the right um, processes to you know keep our community safe but also to ensure that whānau are able to have a you know dignified um, approach to dealing with um, with uh, deaths in, in our community so I, I don't have an easy answer I think it's complex. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I think it illustrates the need exactly for times like this. That the the as Rawat has already pointed out, things change so rapidly. Information changes. Our the approach changes. The rules change. That what we really need more th than 
the distinct information itself is a network to ensure that we can share information um, and share it to the right people. Um, so, you know, Trust Waikato or the NGOs that are listening today, that, that, that's who's at the ground doing the mahi, talking to our whānau. And so we need to ensure that we have a network that when things are updated, we can share it out through that faster. Um, and that will be for all information in, in the management of COVID and the planning in and around COVID in the weeks to come, um, from the first identification of a case all the way through care, um, as Anabari points out, to include tangihanga. Thank you. Yeah, and we're obviously willing to host anything or, or share anything we can as well. I do yeah. want to hang over to Rongo because... Yeah. Uh, um, oh no, yeah, Kate Pa. I just wanted to add it that it'd be really, really cool if there can be um, some type of communication um, strategy um, where we can get that, you know, correct and true information out, in particular to um, the audience that we have um, this afternoon um, to better system. And also, uh, as you all know, a lot of our um, not for profit organisations are so overwhelmed, they're fatigued. Uh, there's just so much um, pressure out there. So probably one of the things that I've got to ask is um, when we're moving into, we're in this phase, but what um, would a successful health, health system look like under the lead of, of the new established Māori Health Authority? You know, what, what can you see would be the benefits that would come from um, having a lead and having another lens on our, uh, our health system. And in particular, a Māori, a Pacifica and an indigenous lens. We'll get it, Jade, first. Oh, okay then. <laughs> um, so slightly biased on this one, but no, absolutely. The, well, there's two critical components, um, isn't it? One is, you know, the validating the way in which we see the world and the way in which we look after each other as as Māori, as Pacifica, um, as Fano um, Indigenous, um, that we the way we approach things, um, whether it's our diabetes care or whether it's the middle of an epidemic, um, ensures that we do what's right for the whole community as a collective. Um, and I think that that knowledge base and that way of being leading the healthcare system means that the approach um, we take makes a difference. And that's great. Anything that shares, that allows the decision makers to think that way is good. But I wanna follow it up with, uh, it needs to come with putia and power to make those decisions, to make the change, to ensure that the services um, are funded to be then delivering that way. Um, so while I love beautiful pictures um, of shared power and structure, um, I really want to see the operational component of that, that continues to share power and continues to share funding and ensures that the system is still responsible and accountable to the way in which it functions. Um, so yeah, cautiously optimistic about what is coming, um, but want to hold my applause until I see how it rolls. Um, less optimistic, but um, <laughs> I'm still activated by it. Um, so let me just bend it towards a conversation which is about, um, you know, the COVID outbreak and what would be different if we had a Māori Health Authority now. Um, and so one of the ways I've been doing some equity ideation, I'm trying to think about and see what would equity look like in this outbreak. And so I created kind of avatar farm. There's 11 people, there's a 17 year old who tests positive. He'd just been down playing basketball with his mates, you know, because you know, lockdown's quite hard and he didn't think it would affect him. So he got COVID positive and he brought it home. His mum's at home and she's got a four year old and a seven year old and she's breastfeeding a baby and her parents live in the house as well. They're 59 and 63. And her sister-in-law and her two adult children in the house, I think there's 11 in the house for them. And so I called this whānau 11, so Mahuru Mātahi. But if we if we think of this whānau, the Mātahi whānau, they are overcrowded. There's 11 people in a three-bedroom house with one bathroom. And so COVID comes along and we've got to do some complex work to keep them safe during 
um, this exposure and in all likelihood it's going to travel through their household but should we look at getting the 59 year old and the 63 year old out into some other accommodation look after them for a week or 10 days somewhere else or should mum and the babies should we get them out and safely into accommodation and look after them for 10 days or two weeks whatever it is and so there's all of that COVID care that we've got to get busy and do a good job on. But if we if we add to that and said actually our intention is equity, then we've got a whānau who's in harm's way because we've um, really not performed as a society in looking after them and their needs. They, they're overcrowded. So surely we're not going to take them out for a week or two weeks and then put them back in harm's way. Surely we're going to look after them. And, and in this two weeks, we're going to find mum and the, the kids a a house to live in and we'll tell you what we better stump up the tenancy deposit in the first two weeks rent and I think they need a fridge and a, and a, a washing machine and so on and so on there's, there's things that we can do that will make a difference and so if we're thinking about equity every single one of these cases that we see currently in the COVID outbreak is an opportunity for us to do equity in very real ways and while we're thinking about it that 17 year olds had a hell of a journey in these last two years their um, education trajectory is really deeply affected by COVID. So how about we start planning, you know, something that's going to make sense for them. It turns out he wants to be an animator or he's got an interest in performing arts or actually really wants to be a truck driver. Have we got in play the kind of support that will get him into a good place? Have we got a, a mentor? Have we got a training support program for him? We've got a lot of work to do for these two old ones in their health care because actually we haven't looked after their diabetes very well and they've missed their diabetic um, retinal, retinal screen and actually there's a, there's a breast screen that's been missed here and um, there's a whole lot of medication stuff that we haven't done for them, let's get that done. And then the sister-in-law, she's got, a, one of her kids has got a drug and alcohol problem we've got to get involved in that. You know, there's just so much that would say to us, we've got to get really busy and do the equity work for, for these farmers. And so if we had a Māori Health Authority, we would be doing those things. I think we'd be doing them really diligently, really deliberately, and we'd do them until the job gets done. So that's what I'd be looking for in Māori Health Authority. That's really interesting, isn't it? Because uh, what I'm hearing there is where maybe in Western culture and mainstream culture, we can pigeonhole or silo different things the whole uh, picture, a whole holistic view of Māori um, way, te ao Māori way of thinking isn't just in health. It is uh, the well-being of the whole person, the whole whānau, and that we just can't actually then think about a, a Māori health authority. It needs to be a little bit wider thinking than that. That's what I get from uh, what you've just told us there, Barbara. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. Right I'd on. add to that, though, Dennis, that it's it's not just that, it's that the inequity that the system has driven over the last few generations uh, has not just been in health. Um, no. And yes, it may impact in health. Um, and kind of going back to the sort of original statement that COVID is just the pressure cooker on the system that's always been inequitable. Um, and that's what I would, I think, speaking for you now, Rawari, but that's what is pointed out there, that actually the pressure cooker has said, all of those factors, we're seeing them right now for this two-week period, but the COVID will move away. That pressure's still there. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So probably another question I'd like to pose with you is, is just around, this, you know, the, um, the people that serve um, the health, health system. So, um, you know, it's been quite amazing that all the whānau order services around our, our I'm talking about our or here, you know, that people know each other, familiar faces, um, but there's a big gap. So just around, um, probably around the workforce, workforce development, you know, and, and reflecting, you know, it's all great having these, um, these services um, for, um, you know, our people, but where's this workforce coming from? Where's the pipeline to um, build that capacity up? Because um, you know it's failed. We would have, we should have, have had a, a great workforce to 
to, um, to support our communities through this crisis. But I'm just interested to um, get some, you know, some dialogue around what your thoughts are around creating uh, opportunities and pathways for, for young people in particular to look at, um, you know, health science and careers in, in this area. Um, and I also know that a lot of young people are getting pulled in to do um, monarchy roles um, throughout our, our country too. So um, if you have any kōrero or any thoughts around that. Um, okay. So for me, this one's around don't, you know, what is it? How's the saying going? Don't let a good crisis get in the way of opportunity or the other way around. Um, so I, that's what I think this is. Traditionally, we've thought of healthcare delivery as a workforce as being quite a traditional thing. Um, we might have a manager who manages the the putia, a doctor who does the doctoring, a nursing who does the nursing, and someone on admin at the front. And that's our workforce, ne. And we've really focused on that. And as we've got busier and bigger healthcare systems, we've just got more of them. And it's just continued to expand. Um, and the crisis or the epidemic has said to us, or has illustrated to us, how inadequate a diverse workforce that is. Um, that as a tākuta, I know what I'm good at, I know my lane, I know how to do my job, but I also need to acknowledge the bits that I'm not good at, that I'm not a specialist in, that aren't my lane, um, and the other whānau members out there and workforce who are good at that. And I think that's what we're starting to understand in the last 12 months, that actually we need a diverse, grounded, integrated workforce that understand our community, that come from our community, that are our community. Um, and we need to acknowledge the specialist skills they bring by being that, whether that's in Manaki, whether that, that is our amazing Kaimanaki army here in Waikato who have been developed over the last 12 months, um, whether it's our NGO staff and our um, providers who have been working seven days, you know, eight days a week effectively for the last few months everyone's playing their role so well and we just need to finally acknowledge that and pull it all together because again going back to my point before the the way we'll get through this is as a community um whether that's us in the healthcare or whether that's um ngos or whether that's people on the street we have to do it together it's the only chance we've got kia ora um I think employment's one of the most important things that we can do for all of our organisations. So um, big shout out to all these organisations like Employee More Māori, that's the game. It, it's really important. It makes such a difference in people's lives to, to have a job. And, um, you know, our health system tends to overcomplicate things and we, you know, we medicalise some things and actually... Uh, one of the best things that we've seen in this um, vaccination program is uh, Māori community providers being able to have um, non-regulated health workers do a whole lot of things. Uh, in Auckland here, we've trained um, dozens and dozens of people to be um, able to do nasal and do swabs because actually it doesn't need a trained health professional to do it. We've, we've proven that we've got evidence of it and we've got these training programs so that people can do a nasopharyngeal swab and actually we train them also in putting on PPE and taking off PPE you know micro credentialing we call it but essentially um, it, it comes off some work in the Mana Kids program where um, we do a lot of um, oropharyngeal swabs throat swabs and it turns out when you think about it as a GP looking after um, 28,000 kids in our program, actually I'm useless at doing oropharyngeal swabs. We've trained people who do 30 swabs a day in the school settings, and I do about three swabs a year. And so you can pick who's better at it, right? So these are non-regulated health workers, but they're bloody good. They're really, really good. And so when COVID came along, we trained them from throat swab to the nasopharyngeal swab. Um, we trained them to be vaccinators. And so um, the opportunities to get lots more employment from our community so that if Manurewa vaccination rates concern us, guess what? We should employ people from Manurewa to do the vaccination program. And, and that's a really great win because, you know, they're going to be trusted parts of the system 
and there's an enduring role for them, to be honest. I want them to be involved next year doing the flu vaccination. I'd love them to be involved in the MMR catch-up campaign and the HPV. You know, there's just so much work that we could get this group of people doing in terms of vaccinations and in other roles in the health system. But, you know, bottom line, I'll come back to it. I say, like, if you could employ more Māori, I'd be really grateful. Thank you. I don't, I don't know whether I'm allowed to talk about this. It might be a secret. So if it's a secret, please keep it secret, everybody. Um, but we um, have funded um, a program with um, uh, Te Putinga and Wintech around a student-led health centre in conjunction with community health providers as well. Um, and it is around Māori and Pacifica uh, health students being in a, an environment that is culturally safe, where they can um, feel looked after in a, in a safe way, where their education outcomes can be more positive because of the cultural uh, aspect of what they're doing um, and, and ensuring that, that we do see a change in the face of those that are working in the health sector. Um, when we first received the uh, application, Ron and I looked at each other and said, is this really what we should be funding? But actually, when we think about equity, it's exactly what we should be funding. We can hold to account WinTech to ensure that there is better outcomes for Māori and Pacifica. And I also like to think about our ethnic communities in this too, because I think they've been left behind. Um, uh, better outcomes for those students and actually providing a better cultural um, health system as they come out of that as well. So I'm hoping we see that in the next couple of years. And please, if I'm not allowed to say that, well then, oh well, <laughs> I'll say <laughs> Yeah, um, look, I do want to steer this look a little bit back towards COVID and what maybe we, we may see in the next, you know, two, three, four, six, 12 months. Um, I think it was said sometime last year that we had defeated COVID when actually it hadn't even started. Um, and I, I get a feeling we're moving into a next phase. Um, and what is that looking like? Is that being modelled anywhere? Do we have any any sort of indication of numbers that we might see with COVID cases, with hospitalisations and the like? And should that information, if it is available, be shared with our communities so that we can prepare ourselves uh, in a greater way and in a way that is a little bit more becoming than... Um, pointing the finger at those that haven't been vaccinated. I'm going to pass to you first, Rauri, because you always make predictions on point. Um, I think we're going to see deaths in the range of three times the road toll. Um, and so we know that the road toll kind of affects all parts of our community and it's going to be you know, three times worse than that. So it's, it's significant in that sense. And if, I, if, if there's 50 or 60 people in the call and I said to you, okay, well, who thinks that COVID's going to be kind of a big impact for two years? Who thinks it's five years? Who thinks it's 10 years? And at the end of that, I'd go, well, I agree with you all. The direct impacts on our health system is probably in the two-year range. We're going to have um, this big wave that we're facing now in Auckland will... Um, have a, a second wave in Auckland probably in February and a third wave a couple of months after that. And each of the waves might be a little bit smaller, but those ripples will be, okay, Waikato, you're probably um, six weeks behind us in terms of your big first wave. You're gonna have a second wave. You're gonna have a third wave and so on. And each one of those waves will kind of have an impact on our health system in the sense of um, our emergency departments are full or our ICU is full or um, we weren't able to do all of the other procedures that we wanted to do for a period of time. So some direct impacts and I think that's going to have um, particular impact for us over a period of say two years. But the other people who are thinking that it's going to last five years or ten years actually there's a truth to that as well. Part of that will be those who are unvaccinated, they don't end up in hospital this time, but lo and behold, six weeks later or 10 weeks later, they've got long COVID. And so long COVID is going to be an impact for us. And it's going to be, for some people, a very significant personal health impact, um, migraines, um, brain fog, uh, tachycardia. You know, there's quite a lot of body sy systems are going to be impacted. And so some of Jade's work over the next two to five years is going to be working with people who've got um, long COVID syndrome. 
And then think about all of the young people who are at school and they've had two years of very disrupted schooling. So the kind of educational trajectory impact is going to be something like five to 10 years. And we've got to do a lot of work to support young people in recovering their trajectory. Um, and I think of them as the COVID generation. So there's some pretty significant long, um, much longer impacts for us to think about as well. But so it's anything from two to 10 years over. And I mean, but I already answered most of that, but what I would take is the second part of your corridor there, Dennis, around the modeling. Um, and so to say that, um, so, you know, we've done some, there's been some very crude modeling of numbers we might expect over a year uh, that might come through. Um, but it, it really, I don't think yet has had the finer understanding of what that's really gonna mean uh, who that's going to be, watch communities, where it's going to be, what does that mean for our providers and what does it mean for those working on the ground. Um, but I do know that that modelling is being done locally anyway, Auckland has theirs, but for Waikato we really want to know what it's going to look like for us in the weeks, months, years to come, particularly weeks and months. Um, and I, I think it's fair to say when that's done with enough accuracy to be meaningful, then that will be shared with our partners, that that will be information that won't be held just uh, to the healthcare system, because we know that it's going to need everyone together to take care of that. Um, I do want to have one moment for some good news in it, though, and to say that, you know, we are the first country to be this vaccinated at the time of the epidemic and at a national level, at a whole of community level, that is going to make a difference to what the next few weeks and months look like. Um, and I think it's important for us to remember that, that we have got a layer of protection that many other countries didn't have. And every day we keep things smouldering in Waikato, that's another day we get a thousand odd people vaccinated and ready um, in the in the weeks to come. So every time we do that, we change the trajectory. So I think that's really important news as well. Otherwise, I completely total call everything that I already said about what's what's to come for us. I see in the chat, Marita has just asked a question, which was I was going to follow up with, and it's around with those numbers. It's actually reasonably scary when you think about it, and there's going to be a lot of self isolation at home. How do we prepare ourselves as a community? Because again, the community sector is going to be called on to be the answer to this, uh, and they're already fatigued at capacity, uh, lacking in funding, uh, and and you know just working hard to get through it. Um, but they will never say no, they'll always carry on. But how can we prepare our community uh, to uh, for this in a way that is um, uh, wrapping your arms around them instead of pushing people away? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think preparation, that's exactly what we've got. We've got some time here in Waikato to prepare. Um, and now's the time for us to do it. And I, I tend to think of that in like a couple of layers. I'm really, um, I like the way Marit has said it. In, in addition to vaccination, I think our focus has been on vaccination. I totally total that's a really key protective thing for our community, but there are other things we can be doing in addition to it. And I like that narrative around it. Um, at an individual level, we should all be getting well. We should be making sure we have our medicines, that we've had our checkups, that we know that we're on the medicines we should be, that we've got our health as robust as it can be for the weeks and months to come. As a far no, we need to think about what will isolation look like? How would what how would we do it as a far no? What is the way we want to do it? How will we communicate to everyone they need to leave us alone for a little while? Um, who might bring us Kai? Who might who are our trusted? providers and who would we lean on for that and who would we want to be involved um, if we were isolating some people in our house and not others could we separate what would be our preferred way of doing that all of that far no preparation means that when we get to that point um, it's not a scary eh because we're ready we're ready for it we've got it and then at a community level um, depending on what it is that as a um, NGO that you're providing or as a provider um, what does the care that you do support those whānau? So is that about supporting them to enable them to isolate kai, nappies, 
um, supporting through MSD to get income. Uh, is it about the cultural needs? So we're not feeling isolated. So we might be physically isolated, but we're not spiritually or community wise isolated. Is it about healthcare? Is it about how do we know how to escalate if someone who's in isolation needs help and we know where our partners are and we've already got those pathways set up so we can call a friend when we get into trouble. Um, and it's around and how are we getting people to hospital if and when they need that. Um, so those are the layers in which I think we should be starting to build and starting to plan now while we've got the opportunity. What did I miss it, Audi? That sounds good to me. Well, I'm hoping that that is uh, planning's underway now because it sounds like quite a job, doesn't it, really? Um, um, I do think of, you know, the community response will be there and they're very, very much centre and part of this. So I'm hoping that those conversations are going on with our community organisations and they are brought in as trusted partners as well. Uh, there's definitely a role to play, but there is also that need around how do we ensure that they're adequately resourced, um, not just with people, uh, but with the right gear, the PPE gear, the right information and, and the putia to ensure that they can do those, um, do the job. And also go think about again to our ethnic communities where through language barrier, they don't hear about things until a few weeks later. And so already they're at a disadvantage because of a language barrier um, and how that's shaping out in terms of ensuring uh, communication is not just uh, in one language uh, or two, but as many as we need uh, to ensure that, uh, that it's uh, filled out properly. Um, so look, I appreciate that. But I want to hand back to you to see if there's any questions from you. There's not much question. It's just that, um, you know, the, the gems that you've been sharing with all of us, um, we, we're definitely going to take away and, 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 and seriously look at, um, you know, having wānanga amongst ourselves and in our different sectors. Um, and taking this information and, and seeing how we can um, enrich the work and enhance the work that's, that everyone's already doing out there already. Um, so, yeah, I don't think I have any other questions. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a mihi, really, to acknowledge the um, yeah, expertise and um, yeah, gems that you've shared with all of us today. Mm. So maybe before I pass over to, um, you know, start to wrap it up and get some of your final thoughts, Jade, maybe some of the health things we can be thinking about and getting ourselves well is maybe a bit less time in front of these things doing. Oh, yeah. And these sort of hilly things. <laughs> but it, it has been really um, a fantastic um, uh, hooey that we've had today and really pleased to hear it from you. So look, if as we're wrapping up, um, just final thoughts. Um, mm. You've shared so much and it's so rich. Uh, and we really do appreciate it. But, you know, what is it that you think we could be doing in the, in the next few weeks? What, it is it that, what, it, what are your final thoughts on this subject? Whether it be equity in health, equity in everything, or in a COVID response? Um, my final thoughts are pretty similar to my starting thoughts, um, that we will get through this as a community the same way we have everything else. But in order to do that, um, we need to trust in each other, we need to work together, and we need a way of having coordinated communication uh, for the whole community, um, because that that is our strength, and it is that strength that will get us through this. Um, but so it means that I, you know, I really finish this off with, you know, we're working really hard in the healthcare system, we're trying really hard to keep this um, smouldering under control for as long as we can. Um, that allows us all the preparation time for the next phase. Um, so mine is more a challenge out to our NGOs, to you guys, to everyone listening today to start that preparation. Work out what your processes are going to look like in the weeks, months and years to come um, and start having those wānanga rongo. I think that's exactly what is needed um, so that we collectively are making decisions and collectively are planning um, to do the strongest response to look after our whānau. Um, and just to finish on, um, Dennis, you said it, equity in all of what we do. The only way we're getting through this is if we do all of it. If we try and just do health, if we try and just do mainstream, we're not going to do as well. This needs to be focused on the if we do the right response for Māori and Pacific, then we will get it well, right for everyone. Um, and it needs to be 
focused on equity and focused on saving lives. Hilda. Thanks. Uh, front of mind for me is um, actually, and it connects to the other two questions we haven't kind of formally answered, but um, the complexity of isolating at home. And, um, you know, in Auckland, if you're living in Umweta or St. Helier's and you've got a four bedroom house with uh, three toilets and there's only three or four adults in the house, isolating at home is actually quite um, manageable. Um, but if you've got 11 people in a house and you're overcrowded, isolation, isolating effectively is very, very, very difficult. And so we're really going to have all of those people in the house exposed to COVID and probably end up positive. And um, so we're going to have some really um, robust conversations with families that are in that position. And we know already in Auckland that what happens is that uh, one person is positive and then a few days later, the next person's positive. So if the family's trying to tough it out and say, well, we're really staunch, we're going to stay together, um, actually, they don't get released until 10 days after the last person turned positive. So, um, you know, another few days and somebody turns positive, the clock goes back to zero, start the 10 days again. Another few days, somebody turns positive, all of you, clock goes back to zero. And so that difficulty, that that's really very difficult to manage. And so good information and somebody in there is going really old school and says, actually, can we provide that information in writing on a piece of paper rather than electronically, we get it. And that's, that's, a, that's a good suggestion. Um, but we've got to support families to be able to try and get through some of that complexity. And sometimes if we had good options for them in terms of accommodation, um, you know, being able to take mum and the, the little kids out and support them with Kai and you know nappies and all the things that they would need to be somewhere else for 10 days or two weeks. And we also take the older couple out and we put them somewhere safe and we provide food and a phone and some data plan for them so that they can manage and the family can stay joined up. But, you know, it's to the extent that we could actually um, curate some accommodation options, it will be really helpful in getting our community through this. And underneath all of that, I think actually here's this health crisis and some people didn't recognize it as a health crisis. And of course, I'm talking about both COVID and the housing crisis. We've got people who didn't believe in COVID who, you know, they don't listen to the TV news and they don't get Radio New Zealand news bulletins. They've, you know, been exposed to different sources of information and it's not until COVID really reaches their household, they go, oh, shoot, it's real. I didn't think it was real. I thought it was a, a conspiracy or whatever, whatever. You know, but the same thing is a lot of people don't realize we've had a housing crisis for about five years. As a GP, I've been working with families who are apparently living in a car. And how did we end up in that place? That I have other patients who go, well, at least I'm living in a garage. How did we end up in that place? That, you know, we ended up with such a race to the bottom now, COVID is really bringing it home to us. We've got a really significant crisis in terms of housing. And so, you know, I just think we should make sure that we're going to learn that lesson. And actually, we've got so much work to do in addressing the housing crisis. And we probably can't address COVID unless we get busy and do something about housing. So accommodation, you know, there was a couple of chats in there about accommodation. I think absolutely bang on. It's one of the most important things we can do and organize as we try and get through this COVID crisis. Thanks for having me, Dennis. Thank you. Look, so much, so much, um, so much um, um, uh, richness in that too, the connectedness of it all going on. A um, uh, couple of things I just want to end on. Um, Here to help you is a website that people can go to and our community know that really well. Um, uh, but that's a great website to go to to get help that is in a way mana enhancing as well, as opposed to lining up somewhere as well. So I think if that's in the thoughts, keep thinking about that. And then the other thing, I'm probably not allowed to say this, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, Trust Waikato was granted um, $2 million out to our community organizations for their great response Now that, over this COVID um, uh, issue. Now that, that in itself is not a, a, a great response. It's only a small part of 
of what those organisations needed, but it's a, a small part to it. We have a recommendation to our board at a meeting next week to think about uh, increasing that again so that we can continue to support our organisations. So I think I've got some trustees on the line here. So uh, <laughs> maybe uh, that's the call out to say yes to that one <laughs> and we'll know how we get on. Um, and before I hand back over to um, uh, Rongo again, acknowledge the work of the community organisations in this response to COVID. Certainly you've saved lives. Certainly you've been the ones that have been bearing the brunt of so much angst in our communities and so much anger. Um, but um, uh, in no way do you move, uh, step away or stand back from that, from that challenge. You do it all the time and you do it with grace and you do it importantly with love. And I think that's a great thing. Um, uh, I'll pass to you. Cool. So just in closing, tēnā rā wātū koe e te tūngāne tākuita Jensen and ki a koe te tūakana Jade kānui taku mihi ki a kōrua hei whaka tūwhera o koutou pātaka mā tauranga e hora hia ana ki a tātou e whakarungu ana ki a kōrua e tēnei ahi ahi. So, tino wai māri e tātou. So, really, really, thank you very, very much once again for sharing all your knowledge. And we're very, really, really fortunate. And um, and just putting a shout out to you all that are listening. This is um, a series of um, put a corridor that we're going to have, it uh, that we've just started. So, um, we are going to be continuing with some other conversations. But um, we really, really appreciate the time and that you've taken out of your busy schedules to be with us this afternoon. So thank you very much. Keep well, everybody. Keep safe out there and enjoy the sun that's out there. And I'm just going to close off our session. <laughs> so no reira mi, no e tātou. Kia tau, kia tātou. Ka tō te ata whai o tō tātou āri ki a ihu kraiti me te aroha o te atua me te whiwhinga tahitanga ki te wairua tapu. Āke, āke, āke. Āmene. Kia ra tātou. Thank you so much. Thank you.